So, sorry for a couple of minutes of delay. So, basically, I made it here on time, right? I ran from, from Osman all the way over here. So, hello to everyone. How are we doing? Excited to be here? No. Oh. Okay, so um, everyone got my email through Canvas yesterday? It worked? Uh -huh. Nobody is showing up at 317 Hammond? I would not know. Some are not here. <laughs> Maybe they are there. Hope they find out the classroom. So, okay, so let's go through the syllabus a little bit, the logistics of the course. So, my name is Wan. I'm a professor of math department. I'll be teaching two sections of this linear programming. It's back to back. Um, so, as you notice, on Tuesdays, I have to run about 15 minutes to get here. I'm thinking today is such a good weather, it was inspiring me. Maybe I should get a bike, then I'll be faster, <laughs> right? But what if it rains and pours and it snows? Then we have to deal with those days. So I'll figure some better solutions out than always being late a few minutes, okay? I'll try that. And on Thursday, we'll not be here. Everyone is aware of that. We'll move to life science building. Um, we'll talk about that building Thursday when we meet there. It's again a computer lab, but there's no other room. They cannot find it. So 3-1 Hammond is an L-shaped computer lab. <laughs> I could not teach there, okay? Office hours are Monday and Thursday. I set up right now um, in the afternoon. If it doesn't work for you and you have questions and whatever you want to talk to me, send me email ask for appointments, okay? Don't be shy about it. It's always good to ask when you have a question, so make sure you are keeping up with the pace of the rest of the class and don't wait until you lag behind. So always ask. Okay, um, now this topic, linear programming, has hundreds and maybe even thousands of textbooks floating around on the market. It was tough to find a good text, and I'm picky about texts. <laughs> Is that a good thing to be picky? So um, I checked quite a few of them, some recommended by colleagues who have taught the course before and blah, blah. So I settled for this one, OK? We'll take homeworks. It has a huge selection of homework problems and many, many examples. And it's quite good. I think we'll be happy with it. And uh, another thing, um, if you read the title, it says linear programming and game theory. So you know there's a sequel for this course coming after 485 on game theory. So this textbook has many chapters, and the last two, three chapters um, are on game theory, actually a very uh, soft introduction to that. So if you shall get interested in that and want to have a sneak peek, you can read the last two, three chapters in this book. All right? So that's that. Um, So I plan to cover from chapter one through chapter seven, um, if I manage to cover. It depends if we manage to do that. And uh, OK, where are we now? On attendance. So I would say attending a class probably, or maybe for sure, is the most important part for your learning. OK, so make sure you attend the class. And if you shall miss one, um, um, if I get the source of the video file, I can make a playlist on YouTube, but only to those students who, for reasons missing the class, I will let you watch those, okay? And you paid for the classes, right? So you don't want to miss, right? Once a student told me that she did a cal calculation with the tuition she paid, divided by the number of hours she's receiving, and she said, for every hour of class, she's paying like 80 bucks. So don't throw that away, all right? Take advantage of me being here. Okay, okay so we will have homeworks, right? My plan now is every week. And uh, um, about homeworks, I, um, I have the following idea. I don't know if we like it or not. So are we comfortable in using Canvas? Angel, Angel is being phased out. 
Are we okay with online forums, online discussion, online submission, online grades? You should be more comfortable with those things than I am, right? I'm the older generation. <sighs> So I will not force you to do that, but this will be offered. So um, you all have some iPhone or whatever tablets that you can scan. There are free scan apps you can download, scan it, save it into a PDF of multiple pages. You can submit on Canvas. I will make an assignment, open a box. You can drop it off there. And the grader will grade online and put comments, and then you view your grades online. If you don't want that, we can still, I will still have the option you hand it in in the class. And I collect, and then I'll hand it back to you. Okay? So with this size, 45 students, if we do that every week, it's going to take away a lot of my class time. So probably I will encourage you to do the online version. So a tiny incentive. If you turn in in the classroom, you turn in at the beginning of the class. If you do it online, it will be at the end of the Tuesday. Okay, you have a couple more hours. Sounds good? It will be offered to you. You can choose. You have a choice. Okay, we'll have two midterm exams in class. The dates are set. Uh -huh. End of September, beginning of November. I kind of, kind of cut it into five weeks of chunks of five weeks. Okay, and there will be a final exam. Okay, so for grades, um, homework 30%. We okay? With that, some students don't like homework being graded, and some likes it. But general um, practice, we count the homework thing because I think it's important to do homeworks, right? And two midterms counts 20% each, and the final is 30%. And I forgot to put the letter cut off, so I will modify and upload the PDF again on Canvas, and you can write it down on the paper if you want. So. If you have like 90% to 100%, that will be A type of grade, A or A minus. If it's 80%, it will be B type. 70% will be C type, and 60% something will be D type, and below 60 will be F. Right? We don't want to go there, so let's not talk about that. Is that okay? So that's like the, the rough guideline. Question? So what is the cutoff between A and A? will be like 93.3, .3, something like that. Is that what you're aiming for? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Is that OK? All right. Any other questions? Everything OK? All right. So are we ready to learn linear programming? It's OK. So let's start. Have a chunk. Okay, to be formal, I will put down the course title. Wow, this is such a clean blackboard. Can everyone see? Is that good enough for those in the back? Is that big enough? Okay. I have a soft voice. It tends to fade away. If you cannot hear me, just in the back, wave your hand, and I'll try to scream, okay? So, okay, linear programming. The title of the course contains two names, have meanings. The first one, linear, so, which is hinting we will deal with linear problems as versus nonlinear problems. Okay, we'll specify what that is. And programming, it's a fancy word. Historically, it's being used. These are called programming. Basically, it means some kind of a, um, a strategy, an algorithm for you to solve certain problems. Okay. So to be kind of a philosophical, let's put ourselves in a bigger picture in the world that we have some problems we want to solve and to see where this course stands in that big picture. Okay, so just just being silly. Okay, the big picture. Okay, so so you have some problem you want to solve. Let's say the problem comes from real world. 
problem. Okay. So often it's described by a word problem, our favorite type of problem in high school, right? Give you a word problem, solve it. Okay. So you have a real world problem, so what do you do? So do we agree that mathematics is a useful tool to solve problems? Mm -hmm. So OK, so we decide we're going to use math. And what do you do? Well, I have to formulate this in a way that I can use math. So I need to rewrite it into a mathematical problem. OK, so use variables and equations and blah, blah, depending on your problem. That is a big step, actually. So in this step, a lot goes on. So you really need to um, know for different problems, how do you formulate different uh, mathematical problems. So this is called math modeling, mathematical modeling. Okay. Actually, we offer a course on that, Math 450, is about mathematical modeling. Okay, there are many different models you can come up with. OK, and then once you have a mathematical problem, you um, want to somehow solve it and come up with some solutions. So let's say I have some solutions of the math problem. By magic, I solved it. OK. So this is what you get at the end. Okay. So again, so from here to here, it's again a big step. You need to do a lot of work to solve that math problem. So depending on your problem, you might find um, you do some analysis and you might find the exact solution as a function, as a number, or maybe you use some numerical methods. You find some approximations. There are many different forms that goes in here. Okay. So let's just throw in some vague words. I will do some mathematical analysis. Okay, and maybe I'll design some algorithm, and I eventually find some solution. Okay, I solve the problem in some sense. Okay, and then. OK, then the final step is now I have this solution of the math problem. I will go back to the real world and then tell the people there, now here's what you have to do according to my solution. So interpretation, right? So interpretation of your solution, of math solutions, OK? Back into the real world. So here, for, for the thing we're going to study, that's, um, that's a, a not such a big step. But for many problems, this could be quite a big step. A time depending problem, you have to show animations, you have to show graphically or number, or there are many ways of interpreting your data. Okay. So what we will be focusing on in this course are these two steps. The first one is how to model a word problem into a mathematical problem okay, of a special type that falls into linear programming setting. And so the first um, few weeks, maybe one or two weeks, we'll be focusing on that. And then once we have this type of math problem, we'll have to figure out what is its property, how does it behave, how do you find a solution, and we'll develop an algorithm to solve it. OK, so these two steps. All right, so let's begin with the modeling. Okay. Now, there are many, many um, models um, in the textbook. So let's start with a classic one. Take this as an example. So. Um, Let's see, I have the handout um, for you. So the first example we will take is the, the diet problem, the other handout that you have there. So this is kind of the classic textbook 
example for linear programming. Usually they start with this diet problem. So historically, that was one of the first being solved using this linear programming. So it's kind of important. Okay. So the setting is the following. So you have to eat food to survive, and your body needs um, different types of nutrients to function. And then you have a selection of different types of food you can choose. Each one contains a set of nutrients it has, right? And also different prizes for each item that you can consume. And then there is also the recommended minimal daily value of each group of nutrients you should take to remain healthy. So the goal at the end will be how much of each group of food you should take so that you still meet the daily nutrient requirements, but you want to minimize the cost. Is that clear? So that's the setting. So that's basically what the word problem is saying. And, uh, and you know, in the real world, this can be a complicated situation because there's a huge variety of food you can choose from, and there is an extensive long list of nutrients probably you should take. Okay. So we will look at a, a, a bit simplified model just to get the idea of how to deal with this problem. Once you get that, you can see that the complicated one follows in the same setting, okay? So let me say that this will be the um, simplified diet problem. Okay. So from the word problem, we want to um, extract information and formulate a mathematical problem. So, okay, so let's write clearly. What is the goal? The goal here, I want to minimize the cost of food, okay? And then, but that's not standing alone because if you really want to minimize you can just say, I don't eat, then you pay nothing, right? But that's not an option. There are some buts there, constraints, right? But, okay, so the keyword one is the minimizing, and the second is the cost. So we'll define these, okay? So but what do we need? We need, but we also have to meet the minimum daily nutrients requirement. OK, so we simplify the problem. So we, we um, select a small number of different types of food. So what does it mean by simplified version of it? OK, so we will not take hundreds of different types of food that's around. Let's just select a few. So. Are we okay with apples? Can we choose apples? Bananas? Well, I can't eat any of these. I'm allergic to all of these. Okay, but I'll, I'll deal. Carrots even worse. I'm really allergic to carrots. <laughs> this diet is not going to be good for me. Um, dates, well, I like dates. That's good. My girls will be happy. I have two daughters who are vegan, so this will be a good diet, but okay, I'm going to mess up for them. I'm going to add eggs in the picture. Are we okay? Five types of food? Do you guess why I choose those five? <laughs> because? <laughs> Alphabet, right? I can use A, B, C, D, E as my variables, which I will do later. Okay, so let's say these are my food, and uh, so the nutrients that I care most about, let's say, I, I can't take the whole table of different vitamins or whatever. Let's say what's important here are protein. That's important. Uh -huh. Vitamin C, it's important. And let's say we care about iron. 
you can choose different ones to care about. So, so this word, simplify, it might sound like cheating, you throw away a lot of things, but in mathematical modeling, that is actually a very important step you take because the real world problems are usually so complicated. If you take everything into account, you have a huge mathematical problem in the end that you don't know what to do. So the wisdom will be to see through what is most important and what can be neglected and come up with a simple problem that captures the core behavior. All right? So, so OK, so I, I'm not saying these are uh, the core behavior, but let's say we simplify to this extent. Okay. And uh, I will set up um, informations. Um, so very often, it is very smart to collect these informations in a table form. So I have a table. Let's put a table. I have different types of food as my first column. Mm -hmm. And then I will list the um, different units. Well, I really don't have to be so picky, but let's say I different, list different units. And then here will be the nutrients. So protein, mm -hmm. um, vitamin C, and iron. It's listed here. And then, of course, I care about price, right? So price, let's say it's cents per unit. Okay. And the nutrients are also per unit. They're all given. Okay. So let's put our food. Apples, bananas, um, carrots, dates, and eggs. So what I will fill in, just some numbers, OK? So apples, the unit is one median apple, one median banana, one median carrot, half cup dates, two median eggs. If you choose a different unit, and then these numbers will have to be adjusted, OK? So you collect that. OK, so let's put in the protein that will be gram per unit I'll put in. So these are just numbers right now, 0 0.4, 1 0.2. OK. So those are the protein in each unit of these different foods. So you see eggs, um, and they are the leaders. They have more proteins. And then vitamin C, so I have 6. 10, 3, 1, 0. So that's, say, um, milligram per unit. Okay. Well, you see, egg is leading in the protein category, but it has no vitamins. So you can't just eat egg, and be, otherwise you won't meet this standard, right? Okay. Iron, okay, milligram per unit. So I have 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 2.6. Is that OK? And it's just a table that um, lists all the nutrients for each food that we have. OK? And then they come with the price tag if you buy. So 8 cents, 10 cents. Three, twenty, fifteen. Well, this might be an old table because I think bananas now are cheaper than apples, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So that's the information. But then we also have the. Um, I need to meet the minimum daily nutrient requirement which I will add to the table. So outside this table, here's what I have. Minimum daily requirement. 
is down here. Okay? So let's put in. So I need to take at least 70 gram of protein, 50 milligrams of vitamin C, and 12 milligrams of iron. Okay, so that's all the information that's been given to me. Okay. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Stop me, all right? Okay, now we want to set up a mathematical model. So now we do modeling, a fancy word. Okay, so we want to write a mathematical problem out of this. So what do we need? Well, I need variables, don't I? Unknowns, something for me to solve, right? So what do you think is a good choice for the variables for this problem? What was my goal? What do I need to find out? Mm -hmm. So the question would be what? I need to fi figure out how much of each food I need to eat, right, how much of each food, so that I minimize the cost but meet the daily requirement, right? So in that sentence, you see how much, meaning these will be my unknowns. I need to figure out how many units of each of these I need to eat. Okay, so can we call them just A, B, C, D, E? Would that be okay? So they will be my variables, A, B, C, D, E. So what are these? These will be number of units of food for daily use. Okay? A will be for apple, B for banana, so on, so forth. Okay. Then the goal is to minimize the cost. Once I nail down how much of each I will eat, can I compute the cost? How much will it cost me? Hmm? So this is called the cost function. Okay, so I will write z equals to, so it's a function, so what does it depend on? How many variables will this function depend on? It would depend on all those that I defined, is that right? So A, B, C, D, E. So it's a function of five variables right now. Is that right? If I eat a certain amount of apples or bananas, if I change that amount, it changes my cost. Okay. So how do I compute the cost function? How do I write it out? If I eat A units of apple, how much would that cost me? And each unit cost 8 cents. 8 times A. Is that right? What about bananas? If I eat B units of banana and each unit cost 10 cents, I will have 10 B. Is that right? And then carrots, 3 C. After three examples, 20 D, 15 E. Is that right? That's how much each food will cost me. So what will be the total cost? I add them all up. Is that right? Is that clear? Okay, we take it easy, the first example, to make sure that it's all clear. So 8A, 10B, 3C, 20D, 15E. Now you see it's useful to have it in this tabular form, isn't it? Once you define this as A, B, C, D, E, you just need to multiply each by whatever variable you call it, A, B, C, D, E, and then you add them up vertically. Okay? That will be your total cost. And what do we want to do with it? We want to make it big or small. Small, the, the fancy word is minimize. So we want to minimize this guy here. Okay? Okay. And then there are constraints, because you, you're not allowed to starve yourself. 
So let me set up constraints. So the constraints, they come from the minimum daily requirement of each nutrients, the different types of nutrition you need to take. So let's look at protein. Okay, so if I take um, A units of apple, and let's say A, B, C, D, E are the units of each food I take, first, can I figure out how much protein will I get if I eat those amount? Is it clear? So how much protein will I get from A apples I eat? 0.4 times A, is that clear? And what about banana? 0.2 times B. It's very similar as how you figure out the cost, isn't it? You multiply this by A, by B, by C, by D, and by E. And then you add them all up. That will be the protein in this food group that you eat. Is that right? So let's write that out first. So it's repetitive now. So 0.4 A plus 0.2, 1.2 B, 0.6 C, 0.6 D, 12.2 E. So that will be the total amount of protein I will get if I eat those amount of each food group. And now here it says minimum daily requirement. You need to consume food to have at least 70 grams of protein. How should I formulate that? This number here shall be, how should it be related to 70? Can it be less than 70? then I don't get enough protein, is that right? So it shall be bigger than or equal to 70. Is that okay? Is it clear? Once you figure this nutrients out, the others follow in a totally similar fashion. Let's look at vitamin C here. So what constraints do I have? What will be the total vitamin C that I will have by eating this amount of food? So multiply this by A, this by B, this by C, by D, and by E, and I add them up vertically. Is that clear? OK, so let me write out. So I have 6A plus 10B plus 3C plus 1 times D. And, and the last one, 0 times E. So let me don't write it. It's nothing. And then I know this shall be bigger than at least you need to reach this value 50. Is that OK? All right, so iron. Anybody wants to do that for me? What should I write down here for iron requirements? Any volunteers? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Is it clear? It's obvious, right? I think that's why you don't want to answer. Okay, next I'll ask some something less obvious. Okay. Hope I copy the correct numbers. So I multiply this by A, B, C, D, E, and I add them up, and it shall be bigger than or equal to 12. Then I will be meeting all my um, daily nutrient requirements. So now, is that all? Do I need to add something else? Probably in this problem, it's not um, relevant, but it might be relevant in others. So um, will it be possible to eat negative one apple? So what does it mean? <laughs> you produce an apple. <laughs> That's cool. You have to take an apple away from your body. <laughs> 
So this means all the variables shall be non-negative. Is that right? That's in this setting. So OK, so I say and, and this is, and is important because it comes in all the problems that we are setting up, we'll be setting up. So A, B, C, D, E, these here shall all be bigger than equal to 0. Now I have all my constraints. Yeah. Is that OK? So let's say my constraints. I put it as star. So what is my problem now? The problem now is the following. Mm -hmm. um, find the minimum of this function f here, depending on a, b, c, d, e. OK, so a fancy word, subject to the constraints listed in the star. OK, so right now we have four constraints. How is that? Is that OK? Setting up the problem part. <laughs> OK, so let's say now the real world is more complicated than this. We say that's a simplified version. Let's say our food group is not only five food. Let's say I put in 20 different types of food. OK? I just blow this up. And then I will be considering mm, 10 different types of nutrients with the values, minimum daily value requirement mm -hmm. given, and the price of 20 different food given. What will that problem be different from this one? My table will be much bigger. Is that right? And I will have to introduce 20 different variables. Is that right? But the way of setting this up, do you see it's exactly the same? Is that right? In the end, you will have a cost function depending on many, many, many more variables. And you will have many more constraints, but it's totally in the same way of setting it up. Do we agree? OK. So setting up a problem is one step. And how to solve it, that's a, a different question. So. The problem as we set up now, so-called simplified version, actually is still pretty complicated, this problem here. And um, um, I cannot come up with a very simple way of showing you how to solve it. So if we shall simplify this further, we can solve it. There are some, some um, graphic tools one can use. So let's do that before we get into more word problems, let's attempt to solve a really simplified, simplest possible food problem. OK, so let's try. OK, so simplest. I, I want to further simplify it. Simplest version. So I want to make it even simpler so I can show you as a concrete, complete example that we set the model and we find a solution. Okay. So let me say I, I'm going to restrict my diet just between two things, apples and bananas. Is that OK? If you, well, if monkeys might be OK with that. Let's say I just, and I throw away those three. Okay? And I still consider three types of nutrients. So how would I modify my model? So let me put it down here. So simple version. We only eat apples and bananas. OK, and not the others. Maybe they're, they're not available for some reason. Okay. So how would we set up our, 
um, model. So in this table here, this part in the middle will be gone. I will just have those two rows, and also the requirement is not changed. Okay. So how would I change this problem? OK, variables. We need to change variables. So I will only have apples and bananas to deal with. Is that right? The others are not in my picture anymore. OK, what about the cost function? How would I simplify the cost? C equals to F A B. What would I do with the cost function? I just need to take those two terms. Is that right? Because these are not in my picture. Is that right? OK. So. Eight A plus ten B. Okay. And what we want to do is minimize. Minimize that one. Okay, constraints. Okay. We could probably take advantage of what we have set up here. So you know, um, only A and B will be in the picture. All these C, D, E part will be gone. So I just need to erase these three and take only the first two kind of a terms in each inequality. Is that right? Do we agree? So let me just write it out. So the modeling part is no, no mystery. So for a protein, I have 0.4 A plus 0.2 B shall be bigger than 70. And for vitamin C, 6A, 10B shall equal to bigger than 50. And uh, iron, 0.4A plus 0.6B, bigger than 12. OK, and I also have the non-negativity constraint. AB shall be non-negative. Is that OK? So it has fewer variables. Actually, it has two variables. So what is the advantages of having two variables? It's a two-dimensional space, which I can demonstrate on the blackboard, which is two-dimensional. Is that right? OK, and that's the thing, actually. OK, so I'm going to label these constraints C1, and that's Constraint number two, and that's constraint number three, constraint number four. Okay, so what we will be using is something called a the graph method. Okay, we will graph things and figure out how to find the minimum. Okay, okay need more space. Right. Okay, so let's start with the constraints. So you know, not just like random values of A and B can work. A and B, your choice must satisfy four constraints. That's a lot of it. Okay, so let's list all the constraints. So start with C4. Maybe that's the simplest constraint. And let's draw this in a domain. This is A, and this is B, positive direction. If A and B shall be both positive, which region should I consider? It will be only the, the first quadrant. Is that obvious? <laughs> Is that right? So that would be the region I'm considering. So I don't even need to draw anywhere else. I just need to stri restrict myself to that. OK, now let's look at constraint number one. And I will be only looking at the first quadrant. 
within that. So what does constraint number one say? 0.4a plus 1.2b shall be bigger than 70. How do I figure that region out? Any suggestions? How would I do that? Mm -hmm. If I figure out, OK, yeah. <laughs> Flip a coin. <laughs> yeah. OK, so um, change this into equal and find that line. And then if it's bigger than equal to, it shall be the upper half. Is that clear to everyone? I need to draw the line represented by changing this inequality sign into equal sign. Once I find out that line, and then bigger than equal, that will be, well, depending on the sign of these two. Now they're all positive. That means the upper half will be the region that satisfies this constraint. Is that clear? So how do you find that line? When does this class end? 12.30. 12 I think they just have a double book. No problem. Oh, double book? Thank you. OK. <laughs> OK, where were we? How do we, find that, how do we find that line when it's equal? So you need to, a line goes through two points. Is that right? If you can identify two points, you have the line. Is that right? What are the two points of your choice? The intercepts, right? Set A equals to 0, find the intercept on B. And set B equals to 0, find the intercept on the A axis, connect them. Is that clear? OK, so we're not, we're not going to really fuss over that much. So let's say. When b is 0, what's the intercept on a? Will be 70 over 0.4, right? What's that number? 70 over 0.4, 135, that's the intercept. And then on the b will be 70 over 1.2, which is 58.333. Okay, approximately there. Okay, here. So I connect these two lines, uh, two points, and I get a straight line. And above that will satisfy the inequality. Is that right? Okay. So, but I restrict myself to the first quadrant. So it will be that region. Is that clear? Okay. Well, let's look at constraint C2. Once you figure out how to do C1, C2, C3s are very similar, isn't it? They have the same form, bigger than, equal to, and on the left-hand side, it's a, a linear function. OK, so for C2, I also put this into equal sign, find the intercept in A axis and B axis, and take the upper um, region of the line. OK, so the intercept will be on A, set B equals to 0, 50 over 6. What is 50 over 6? It's about 8.3. Let me just write 50 over 6. It's about 8.3. And then the other is 50 over 10, which equals to 5. So um, this is illustrative, not really up to the proportion. So it's this region up there, right? And uh, the third one, the constraint, A, B. So the third one is totally similar. So the A intercept will be 12 over 0.4, which is um, if that's 70, so that's 30. 
and uh, 12 over 0.6, that will be 20. 20, okay. We try to put them together eventually. So it's this region. Okay, so it says all these constraints must be satisfied. So we need to put all these four constraints together and find the intersection of those shaded area. Is that right? Okay, so let's put them together. Okay, so maybe I draw a somewhat bigger picture. Mm -hmm. A, B. Okay, only the first quadrant. So for constraint one, I will have 135, which is quite over here, and 58, which is here. So let me draw a straight line. So that will be C1, constraint C1. It's above this line. Right now it's all above. And C2 will be a small number, let's say 8.3, and 5 will be here. So let me write this. So this will be 135, and 58.3, that's 8.35, and that's C2. And C3 is about 30 and 20, so let's say this is 30, this is 20, because it's above that one, so. That one will be C3. And uh, it's always above <coughs> these lines that I need. So, yeah? This shouldn't affect the point you're trying to make, but for C1, it should be 175. Oh, <laughs> is that right? Yeah. 175, yeah, okay. Yeah, I have it 175 on my notes. I don't know why it becomes 135. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we want to find the region that's above all these three lines. What would I have? It will be the region above line from C1. Is that right? If I restrict myself here, and then all the constraints will be satisfied. Do we agree? It's the intersection. OK. So this is the region that the region satisfies C1 to C4, all the constraints. OK? So this region carries a name. Let's throw in some terminologies. So such a region where all the constraints are satisfied, this is called the feasible region. Okay. So now your job is to look for AB values, look for points, pairs of AB in this feasible region such that your cost function reaches its minimum, restricted to that feasible region. Is that clear? That's what we want to do. Okay. Now take a close look at the cost function. How do we find that? So what about the cost function? How do we know its value? How does it behave? Z equals to 8A plus 10B. If I think, I think a three-dimensional space where A, B are the X and Y, and Z is the third um, dimension, how will I plot this? How will the plot of this function look like? Hmm? It's a number times A, a number times B. OK, think 8X plus 10Y. <laughs> Z equals to that. What will be? the graph of this function in a three-dimensional space. It's a plane. Do we see that? Because remove A, think only B, it's a straight line. Remove B, think A is straight line. It's straight line everywhere you cut through. So it has to be a plane. Is that right? And we, we have this concept of, uh, for any function, 
of two variables, we have this concept of a, a contour curve. Normally, it will be a curve where the function takes the same value for a collection of x, y points, right? So for this problem, what will be these contour curves? If I want to say um, z equals to 80, what type of a and b value will satisfy that? What will be the contour curve for this problem? If you have the function value that's a plane and you cut it horizontally, what will be the cut? If you look above, it will be a, a line. Is that right? OK, so if we actually have contour lines. OK, so let's try to draw them. A and B. OK, so my function is uh, 8A plus 10B equal to some constant k. k is just, right now, is a constant. Okay. Let's say if I pick k equals to 80, what will I have? Well, I will have 8a plus 10b equals to 80, which will be a straight line. Is that right? What would that line be? Well, find the intercept, and then you will have it. So, and uh, you will have 10 here, and you will have um, wait a second, and A, yeah, you will ten, 10 here, um, you will have 8 here. And let's say along this straight line, I will have K equals to 80. So I find 1. What if I change the K value? What will be another contour line? How would it relate? to this one that I already found. First, you know it's going to be a straight line, right? Will that straight line intersect with this straight line? Can the function take two different values at the same point where they intersect? It can't. That can happen only for discontinuous functions. This is a continuous function. So it can't, which means all contour lines will have to be parallel. Is that clear? OK, so let's draw a bunch of parallel lines. Parallel, parallel, parallel. So along these lines, k will be constant. So last question. If I go up this way, hopping from this line to that line to that line to that line, does the k value increase or decrease? If I go this way, selecting lines in this direction, A and B will get bigger, K will get bigger. Is that clear? So that is the direction where K would increase. Is that OK? All right. So now let's put this back. So where do I have the minimum value of the function, which is now actually represented by the k, um, choosing points only in the feasible region. So let me use a, a different color chalk and to show. So will it be OK I transport these um, um, contour lines into this feasible region plot? OK, I draw these parallel lines. OK, so let's say I have some. That's one k value. That's another k value. That's another k value. That's another k value. So these, you know, these are curves, uh, straight lines with the slope equals to, um, you flip it, negative 8 over 10. Is that right? OK, so looking at the graph, where do you think I find my minimum? where will the contour line has constant value, which contour line contains points in the feasible region, and it's as small as possible. Any suggestions? You think that point will be good? 
is not good because if I move a little bit down, my k gets smaller. Is that right? So that's not good. Okay, what if I reach here? Is that good? Would that be the minimum? No, because if I, if I move along the edge, I move over here, I reach a contour line with less k value. So where will be the minimal? We are there. We got there. So this corner here actually gives me the minimal. Do we agree? All right. So let's summarize. What did we find? We find that at um, the point A equals to 0, B equals to 58.3, the function f reaches its minimum okay, from the feasible region, of course. And what is the minimum value? f minimum equals to f0, 58.3. So you just need to put a to be 0, b to be 58.3 back into the function. So it'll be 10 times b, which will give me 583. So that will be cents. Right? $5.83. Is that right? That's the minimum. Okay. So, okay, enough math and go back to the real world problem. So what is the what is the solution telling us? How do we translate it back? What should you do? if you are in that situation that you can only eat apples and bananas. What is the solution telling you? You eat no apples. You eat 58.3 bananas <laughs> per day. Is that right? If that's what you want to minimize, if that's what your constraint is, OK? So if you eat 58.3 bananas, and your cost will be $5.83, and that is the, the minimum cost in this setting. OK, so let's say too many bananas. Right. Is that OK? Any questions, comments? OK, so I would like to um, make some further observations. So we set up a model, we simplified it, and then we set a simplified, simplest model, and we solved it. And we have a solution for one example. Let's um, do some observation. What do we observe from? Maybe it's something um, specific for this problem. Maybe it could be a general property that we are observing through this simple problem. Okay. So that, this was the problem we did. And uh, earlier also, there's a more complicated one, which I just erased. So I want to say that all the constraints are linear constraints. Okay, let me do not define it in a rigorous setting. So the constraints are bigger than equal sign. If you put an equal sign, you have a straight line. So the constraint is always on one side of a straight line. Okay, let's say that's linear because the border, the boundary is a straight line. Okay, all of these are kind of a, like that. Okay, um, the same thing can be said about the cost function for this problem. So the cost function here, what we have is a, a function of two unknowns, A and B. And uh, A is multiplied by a number, and B is multiplied by a number. You are adding them up. Think A is a constant. This is a linear function of B. When b is a constant, it's a linear function of a. Is that right? So 
it's a linear function. Is that right? So the cost function is linear. Well, it's, uh, usually it's people not so restrictive about saying this is linear. Let me give you a fancy word. Well, I call it affine because later on I could add any constant, let's say 10, onto it. I minimize that. This 10 has no saying because it's fixed number. I'll still minimize this portion. Okay, so we will allow extra numbers being added, and then it's a fine function. Okay, it doesn't change the fact that the plot will still be a plane. You just be lifting up or down if you add a number to it. Is that clear? Okay. Now, if all the constraints are linear, at least for this problem with two variables, so two variables. What can you say about the feasible region? OK, this is probably not the best example. So the feasible region we have here, look at the boundary of the feasible region. Is all, they're all straight lines. Is that right? And this is called a polygonal boundary. Is that right? So feasible region, so boundary of feasible region. There are lines, straight lines. OK, lines are straight lines. So it's a polygonal kind of a shape. So you think, if you have a cost function, its plot, the graph of it is a, is a plane, tilt with certain angle. The angles are determined by these two numbers. And you want to find its maximum or minimum restricted to a region that is polygonal shaped, where would you find its maximum? What, where did we find the maximum? For this example, we find it here, which is on the boundary. Isn't that right? Not only that, it's at the corner of this boundary. Is that right? Do you think that should always happen? Hmm? Let's put that observation. Minimum here in this problem is attained at the corner, or a better word, the vertex of this polygonal shape. Do you think that should always happen? As we argued before, if I take an internal point, can it be a minimum? It can't, because I can always push further towards the boundary. Is that right? Is that right? Do we agree? <laughs> so maybe that's a general property. We'll see. Is that OK? How are we doing? You're much quieter than the other class. The other class, they talk a lot. <laughs> All right, um, OK, let's look at the second problem. We can just set it up today, and we will solve it next time. All right? I was late for a couple of minutes. Can we use two more minutes? Would that be OK? We'll just set the problem. Okay. So in the handout, there is a second problem here. It has a fancy name called the blending model. So today we're all about eating. So instead of human eating, a farmer has to feed his stocks, let's say chickens or cows or whatever. Let's be a little bit abstract. He can choose between two feeds, feed one and two. And he's considering three different types of nutrients. Let's just call that. A, B, and C. Is that OK? And he can choose to buy some, part, some of feed one, some of feed two to feed his stock. And they come with different price and different nutrient composition. And there is also a minimum nutrient value that has to be satisfied from each group. So what should the farmer do? Is it clear, the setting? 
Do you recognize this as totally the similar as the diet problem that we just talked about, but some kind of a disguise, a different wording? Okay, so let's look at this. Example two, blending problem. How do you mix things to achieve desired property? Okay, so I will give you the table right away and not putting down the words. So I have two types of feeds, one and two. And I have three types of nutrients, A, B, and C. And then I have the cost for each feed. OK, so let me put these numbers. Three, two, seven, two, three, six. And then the first feed, feed one, is a bit expensive because it probably has higher nutrient values. And feed two is a bit cheaper. And then outside this table, I have my minimum requirement, daily requirement or weekly requirement, whatever you call it, for each nutrient. And uh, OK, let me put it up than your requirements. So for type A, it has to be 60 at least, 84 for B, and 72 for nutrient C. Okay. Will it be okay? I set it up. We just set it up. I think we are pretty comfortable with this. Is that right? Okay? Okay. So let's define our variables. How about I call it x and y? Would that be OK? x will be the amount for feed 1. y will be the amount for feed 2 that I give to my stock every day or every week, whatever. OK. And then we need to set up a cost function. Mm -hmm. which will be my cost function. So let's write z equals to f. Now the cost depends on two variables again, x and y. That's what I call them. So anyone want to help me out? How do I write my cost function? This column will be helpful for me. Is that right? So I, what do I do with 10? 10x plus 4y, OK? So is that straightforward? Is it all clear? Mm -hmm. OK, let's list the constraints. OK, so we have constraints from nutrient A and B and C. I have three of these constraints I must meet. So, so the algorithm will be you go to the column for A. You call this x, this is your variable, and this is your variable y. You multiply this by x, this by y. Actually, all of this are multiplied by x, all of this are multiplied by y, and then you add them up vertically, right? And the sum shall be bigger than the requirement that's listed down here. Is that clear? That's just how you do it. OK, so let's put this up. So I will have 3x plus 2y shall be bigger than 60. 7x plus 2y shall be bigger than 84. And 3x plus 6y shall be bigger than 72. Is that all? What did I miss? The non-negativity non constraint, right? All the variables here we consider are bigger than or equal to 0. Okay, And that will be the constraint. So we want to minimize this function, subject to these four constraints. Okay. So next time, we will solve this problem one more time with the graphing method so we have a solid understanding of it.